and to focus your minds on Jesus. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his stripes, We are healed. As a child, I always wondered when the resurrection happened why the wounds were still there. Why didn't God? restore Jesus to his condition before the crucifixion, unwounded. But that was how they recognized him. This is the source of our redemption. And we should never forget what it cost. Today is about remembering how costly peace is. and the sacrifices that made it possible. So we're going to begin worship now by singing our opening song, Peace in Our Time, O Lord. If you're using the Salvation Army songbook, it's 1010, and we should have the words coming up on the screen. Let's stand and sing this opening song of worship this morning.
please take your seats and let's pray. Lord, this morning we acknowledge our need for peace in this troubled world. We bring before you all the conflict situations that are happening on a huge scale. But we also bring to you ourselves in our brokenness, in our troubles, in our sleepless nights. Our need is for peace. And we pray, let there be peace on earth, Lord, and let it begin with me. Amen. We're going to enjoy a video presentation now, and uh, we're going to use the song 608, Make Me a Channel of your peace. We're not going to sing it, we're just going to watch images from around the world and we're going to reflect on these words together in song 608. You should also have a poppy. And as you watch the video and reflect on the words, I want to invite you to write the name of a person or a nation or a situation that requires God's peace today as an act of prayer. And as we look at these images, I want you to hold it in your hand and pray that the Lord Jesus himself will bring peace to that situation. Make me a channel of your peace.
I'd like to invite Patience and Hydran and Iva and myself. And we're going to read out the words of this song in our first languages. Mari, ndite o mudzio wel garurweni. Pane ruvengo ndi unze rudo. Pane marwadzo ndi unze runyara rurwenyu. Pane kusatenda ndi unze rutendo rwenyu. Mwari ndite kuti ndirege kuda kunyaradzwa asi kunyaradza vamwe. Kuda kunzwisiswa asi kunzwisisa vamwe. Kuda kudiwa asi kuparudo ne moyo wangu wese. Mach mich zu einem Boten deines Friedens, wo Verzweiflung herrscht, lass mich Hoffnung bringen, wo Dunkelheit herrscht, Licht allein, und wo Traurigkeit herrscht, nur Freude. O Geist, gib dass ich nie so sehr danach trakt, getrustet zu werden, als zu trösten, verstanden zu werden, wie zu verstehen, geliebt zu werden, als mit ganzer Seele zu lieben. Make me a channel of your peace. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. In giving of ourselves that we receive. And in dying that we're born to eternal life. O oh Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand to be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace. Amen. We're going to um, enjoy another video now. And uh, we've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount series. And we're going to enjoy the, uh, the next Bible Project video on our topic today, which very fittingly is called Do Not Judge. Jesus called his followers to live with radical generosity, to be peacemakers who love their enemies and to hunger and thirst for right relationships. Jesus called this way of life a greater righteousness because it fulfills God's will for his people that's expressed in Israel's scriptures, the Torah and prophets. But in this section of his teachings called the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives some warnings about potential traps along the way. Traps? Yeah. For example, when you spend a lot of time studying God's wisdom in Scripture, it's easy to start thinking of yourself more highly than you should, ignoring your own blind spots. And it can feel natural to start handing out God's wisdom to others when you think they need it. So the earnest quest for doing good could lead to a lack of self-awareness and a judgmental attitude? Exactly. 
That's why Jesus opens his teachings on this topic by bluntly saying, Do not judge. Well, that's a way to avoid the trap, I guess, but it's not easy when I see other people living foolishly. Jesus invites us to take our instinct to judge others and instead empathize with them. How would I want to be judged if I were in their place? What standard would I like to be measured by? Well, I'd like to be judged fairly, for a start. Right. The problem is we're often unaware of our own character flaws and of the biases that can distort how we see others. This is why Jesus continues with a well-known parable. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the beam in your own eye? Jesus takes that impulse to judge others and he redirects it as an opportunity for critical self-reflection. Okay, so if I see someone who I think is being angry and I feel like judging them, I take that as a chance to reflect on my own issues with anger. Right, or as Jesus says, first take the beam out of your own eye and then you can see clearly the speck in your brother's eye. Okay, so let's say I've dealt with my issues. Now it's time to remove that speck. Maybe. Jesus doesn't actually give us a formula for what to do next. But if I notice that a person's choices are clearly hurting them, I should help them, right? Not always. Sometimes people are not in a place to receive help. Offering God's wisdom will only make them angry, so it's actually unwise. Jesus uses a riddle to make this point. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and don't throw your pearls in front of pigs. Jesus is drawing on an idea from the biblical Proverbs. Don't correct a fool, or you could become like them. Wait, so leave people to ruin themselves? Not necessarily. Sometimes you should step in and help. That same proverb continues, correct a fool according to his folly, or he'll be wise in his own eyes. So knowing when or when not to get involved requires discernment. So it takes wisdom to know when to offer wisdom. Exactly. And God loves to give wisdom. So Jesus says we should cultivate the habit of asking for it. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened for you. For everyone who asks will receive and the one who seeks will find. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. The God of the Bible is like a generous parent. Even bad parents still want what is best for their children. And how much more, Jesus says, will our Heavenly Father give good gifts to his children when they ask? And the gift we need from God is more wisdom. Now, Jesus ends this section of teaching with one of his most memorable wisdom sayings. Everything you desire that people would do to you, so you should do to them. When God's wisdom feels far off and life is way too complicated, start with empathy for the other. How would I like to be treated? And how would I want others to offer God's wisdom to me? Well, I would want to be treated with kindness, with patience. And ultimately, I just want to know that I'm loved. So start there, and then continue with every ounce of wisdom that our generous God gives you. We're going to uh, sing again as we give to the Lord in the offering. And uh, we're going to use song 220 from our Salvation Army song. But great is the darkness that covers the earth. Oppression, injustice and pain. Nations are slipping in hopeless despair, though many have come in your name. Watching while sanity dies. Touched by the madness and lies, come, Lord Jesus. Let's stand as we sing this song through and bring your offering to the Lord this morning.
Before we pray over the offering, we're going to sing that song again. And this time, I want you to bring your poppies to the front as an offering to God. And maybe as you place it on the mercy seat, you just want to say the name of the situation out loud. And we're going to offer this to the Lord today. And then we're going to pray over all our offerings as we give them to him. So let's sing the song again, Great is the Darkness that Covers the Earth. And I'm going to invite you to come and to bring your poppies, praying for peace. If you haven't got one, it's not too late. There's some at the back. And we're going to offer them to the Lord this morning. Let's sing again.
I know you've been standing a lot, but I would like, if you're able to, to invite you to stand for the act of remembrance this morning. Please stand. They shall not grow old as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for their tomorrow, we gave our today. I'd like to invite Michael to come and bring our Bible reading to us this morning. Please take your seat. 
Bible reading. Uh, for those of you who, who might not know, we're uh, following the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we've got to chapter 7, which is the part that talks about judging. We're going to be reading chapter 7 through to 12 together. It's on page 971 in the Blue Church Bibles, if you want to follow along there. Do not judge, or you will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you used, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this is the sum of the law of the prophets. Amen. Is it over to me? Okay. Let's uh, bow our heads and pray. I know we've prayed already, but I think it's always good to pray before we receive the word. One, so that I don't say anything I shouldn't. And two, so that our hearts are open to receive what God is saying today. Father God, we just come before you and as we approach your word, as we take time to, to look at what you have um, said to us today or what you're saying to us today, we pray that you will give us wisdom, Lord, as we listen. I pray that you will give me wisdom as I speak, Father God, so that what comes forth is what you have prepared. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as, as Rebecca said, there's a, there's a sense in which today it's fitting that do not judge others seems to fall on Remembrance Sunday, because how many conflicts has arisen because people have made wrong judgments about others that have blown out of control and caused all sorts of problems. Now, as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, we've tended to... to cut things up into their sections um, and, and do, do the little bits separately. But this time, we're going to bring everything together because everything that's being said, even though on the surface of it, it might not seem that way, and on the surface of it, that's not normally how we connect those verses. That's actually how they're meant to be connected. When Jesus is saying, ask and you will receive, he's still talking about the difficulty of judging other people. So we're going to look at it as a whole. So we're going to start today, Jesus says some familiar words or starts in a familiar way. We're going to start with the do not judge part. In the Sermon of the Mount, he gives us often warnings throughout 
when he's about to say something. Last week, we, we were, or a couple of weeks ago, we were talking, um, he said, do not store up treasure in heaven. It was a warning to us about storing things on earth rather than valuing the things of heaven. Well, this week he's saying, do not judge others. Now, I wonder if, you, if you're embarrassed to show of hands, don't worry about it, but who hears judge somebody else? Yeah. Oh, some of you are doing very good then. You've never judged anybody. I think you might need to uh, do some self-reflection there. <laughs> if we're honest, we've all judged people at different times, haven't we? You know, we've all found ourselves in that moment where we're looking at somebody else thinking, oh, they shouldn't have done that. Or thinking, oh, I would have done it differently if I were them. We've all done it, no matter if it's in our time now or Jesus' time then. Judging others is a trap that we all seem to fall into. In Jesus' time, sorry, Jesus gives us this command not to judge others, but he kind of frames it within a couple of images. So in Jesus' time, um, you couldn't go to the shop and buy a prepackaged pack of Rice Krispies. To be honest, you couldn't get Rice Krispies anyway. But you couldn't go to the shop and get a, a pre-measured amount of rice or a pre-measured container of wheat or flour. Everything was, was measured on scales, wasn't it? And Jesus uses this common image for them of scales to help them understand one of the dangers. Because not only is Jesus saying it's dangerous to judge. He's saying it's dangerous to judge because, one, you will be judged, and two, you'll be judged by the measure that you judge others. Jesus uses this idea of the scales to talk about the way that you can judge people, because they used to use weights. They'd put weights on one side, and they put the goods on the other to make sure you got the proper amount that you had asked for. And um, these weights, what Jesus is talking about here is our weights are our values. The way we judge other people, we tend to judge them from our values, from the way we see the world. Our values are the things that we see as being important, the things that we often see as being right or we see as being wrong. Let me give you an example. Tim, can you switch over? We're going to, we're going to, Close the PowerPoint for a second, or the Song Pro, we're going to open the PowerPoint, and we're going to have a little example, okay? So, we have a person, can you hit the, there we go, if you can hit the button when you get a chance. So, we have a person sitting on the street begging for money. And then we have another person who gives some money. And there's two people that see this happen. The first person, you should just have to hit the thing to move it on, Tim. Could you close it and reopen it then? Are you able to help them, Shirai, or? Okay. Sorry. This, this is technology, isn't it? I thought, I'll have all the images. It'll draw people in. It'll be really powerful. And then it doesn't work. We'll see if they can get it working. If not, I'll, I'll, you'll have to visualize it in your mind. So if you open the PowerPoint again. You did close Song Pro, didn't you? Yeah. Like close, close it not just minimized it. <laughs> Can you go on to slide two? There we go. So there's, excellent. Are you ready for the powerful moment? Here we go. There's, there's two people watching, okay? There's two people that see this going on. The person on this side, they think, can you next slide? There we go, they're watching, they say, 
That's so generous. They're so, they're so good. They're showing that person that they really matter by giving them some money. The person on the other side, he's watching. He says, what a waste. They'll probably spend it on drink. If they really wanted to help homeless people, they should donate to the shelter. Two people making judgments. And there could be an argument that perhaps they're both right. They both have a focus on helping people who are in need, but they have a different view as to what they see going on as to how good that is at achieving the goal, isn't it? The one person looks at it and they think that's going to bring value to that person, that's going to uplift that individual, and the other person looks and thinks, actually, maybe if you gave it to the shelter, you could help more people and they could have a place to stay tonight. Two perspectives on the same thing. They're using their values and their perspectives to make a judgment about what they're seeing. Now, Jesus says we are going to be measured by the same measure that we use to judge others. How many people feel good about being judged by the way that you judge other people? Show of hands, anybody feel good? No, you're all wise people. That's good. That's good. Because when you reflect upon it, we wouldn't probably not feel so safe about somebody else judging us by the way that we judge other people. And it's not necessarily that perhaps you think that the way you judge other people is unfair. Because there's an element that takes place in here that we often don't think about. Now, in Jesus' time, we're talking about these measures, these scales. So, um, there used to be a lot of fiddling. Some of the market traders, some of the measures didn't weigh exactly what they said they weighed. So maybe it was, it was often a little bit less. It didn't weigh as much. But they would tell the person that that's what they asked for, and they'd get less than what they'd asked for. You do that just a little bit over a lot of time, and they'd make a lot more money, wouldn't they? Now, what we tend to do is when we judge another person, can you see into their mind and see all their intentions and thoughts? Probably not, no. But when we judge ourselves, do we know all our intentions and thoughts? Yes. So what we tend to do is when we judge another, we don't know their intentions, we don't know what's going on in their mind, but when we judge ourselves, we tend to put that thumb on the scale we say, oh, but I'm a good person, really. I'm just trying to help them, really. I, I'm not trying to judge at all. I'm just doing this or I'm just doing that. We tend to skip, uh, tip the scales in our own direction. So we, we can fall into this trap thinking we're a super fair person, but actually we often judge ourselves less harshly than we judge others because we see what's going on inside. We'll quickly find it a bit uncomfortable if we're being judged by our own measure of fairness when somebody else is doing the judging, where they're not putting the thumb on the scale. Jesus is keenly aware that one day we are all going to be face judgment. The Bible tells us that one day Jesus is going to sit in that place of judgment and judge us. And he's saying to us, look, don't judge because you're going to be judged. Make it better for yourself on the day of judgment by not leading a life of judgmentalism and, and thinking you're better than everybody else and going around telling everybody else what to do. Because one day... It's going to happen to you. Now, I wonder um, if there's anybody here like me who's a bit of a, a Bible nerd. Um, they like it when, when you delve into what words mean and all that kind of stuff. Anybody that interested in the Bible? 
Okay, we got a couple. We got a couple. That's good. That's good. Excellent. So you like this next bit, okay? So in English, we have the word judgment. That's one word that we use for this. In Jesus' time, the word that they use would change according to the situation or the occasion that they're talking about the judgment. Now, there's two particular words that are of interest to us. The first one is crino, okay? And that's the word that Jesus is using here when he's saying, do not judge. He's using the word crino, okay? Now, this word here, it has two parts to it. The first part is to evaluate, uh, to assess a situation, and to make a judgment about what's going on. So, it's not always about a person. It could be about a situation you're facing, but it could also be about a person that you're interacting with. Now, most of us would look and, and say, we do that all the time, don't we? Um, you know, we, we we're faced with situations where we have to make judgments. We're faced with people where we have to conclude if it's safe to interact with them. So there's this sense of evaluation and analysis from what you see from their behavior and what you see going on in the situation. The second part of this is that you condemn or you pronounce sentence or you determine an action. So we see this kind of thing best happening in Scripture if we all remember the woman caught in adultery. Have we all remembered that story? You're all very subdued today. What about some hallelujahs? And <laughs> yeah, give me some encouragement. Yeah. The, the woman caught in adultery is a situation of this. The people that have found something, they've made an analysis, they get their stones ready to throw them and kill her, they take her to Jesus and say, what should we do? And Jesus says, you who without sin be the one to cast the first stone. And then Jesus goes on, doesn't he? Everybody leaves one by one. And it's just him and the woman and Jesus says, I'm not going to chrono you. I'm not going to sentence you. I'm not going to condemn you. But what does he say after that? Go and sin no more. So in one sense, in one breath, he says, I'm not going to judge you in this way. I'm not going to condemn you. But then he does make a judgment by saying, go and sin no more. There are certain situations where we, we are called to make judgments. Now, the word, the, another word used for making a judgment is crisis. Okay, so crisis, can you assume, can you work out what word might, in English, that we might be like crisis? What is it? Crisis. Crisis. So crisis, we often see crisis, now we see it as something terrible that happens, okay? But in Jesus' time, what crisis meant was a pivotal moment where you are pushed, you, you cannot avoid making a decision or making a judgment. And there are times, like I've said, where we're going to have to make judgments. So Jesus starts out strong, he says it's best not to judge people at all. But then he goes on to say, in those situations where you have to, those crisis moments where you're, you're pushed into a moment where you have to make a decision or a judgment, these are the things you should keep in mind. This is where we get the plank. He says, how can you take the speck out of your brother's eye when you have a plank in your own eye. Jesus is encouraging us that before we judge, we need to step back and we need to look at me first. We, um, in a previous core that we were in, we had two ladies that absolutely disliked each other. 
They, they would just always be picking each other apart. They'd always be coming to Rebecca and I and saying, oh, you know, she's going to cause trouble or you've got to watch her because she, she's like this and she's like that. And do you know what the funny thing was for me and Rebecca is they were the same side of the same coin. They were the exact same person. Well, they weren't the exact same person. But the things that bothered them about the other person was the very thing that they did themselves. Sometimes we judge other people because we see something in them that we don't like in us. So we need to step back, reflect on ourselves, get that plank out of the eye so that we can see things more clearly to help our brother. We need to deal with our own issue that might be going on within ourselves that might be similar to the issue we're judging somebody else for before we're able to come alongside them and show them compassion and care and helping them to remove the speck. The second bit of what Jesus says, he goes on, he says this, and then he goes on to say, what does he say? Don't throw pearls among swine or give dogs what is sacred. Now, I've heard this used in all sorts of ways. I've never heard it used in terms of how you judge people. I've heard it used as justification for, oh, well, we don't want to waste our time witnessing to those people because, you know, they're really lost sinners and they, they you know, they don't deserve it or they, they won't listen, so let's focus on the people that will listen. And I've you, you heard it used in all sorts of ways, but never in this way. It's connected to this idea of judgment. And so first Jesus is saying, first step back and assess yourself. And then he says, now assess the situation. Use your wisdom to know when the right time is to come alongside somebody who you might need to correct or you might need to speak into their life because something's going on and make sure it's the right time. Have you ever had somebody come and give you news and it was totally the wrong time to do it? What happened when they did that? What happened? Did you explode? Did you, did you get angry and push them away and say, look, I don't need to hear this. You don't know what you're talking about. That tends to be the reaction when we pick the wrong moment to speak to somebody. That's that image of the dogs attacking you and the pigs trampling over top of it. That's pointing us towards the reaction of people when we don't use wisdom in terms of when we come to somebody else, a brother and a sister, to offer guidance or correction. But Jesus, I, I love Jesus. Well, of course I love Jesus, otherwise I wouldn't be here. But I, I love the way he does teaches things because he takes these really complex things because you might be thinking, oh golly, how can I ever know? How to, when to judge, when to speak to somebody, when to, to, to act and take action, when not to take action. It's, it's a, it can be a minefield. Well, Jesus gives us two bits of advice. Pray. We, set, we saw in the video, didn't we? Ask. If we ask for wisdom, we'll receive it. If we seek wisdom, we'll find it. If we knock on the door of wisdom, the door will be open and we'll be able to get it. We often use these words for prayer generally about anything we might want, but Jesus is framing it in this discussion about, ju about judging others to ask for wisdom. He's saying, if you want wisdom, ask and you will receive. If you want wisdom, seek it and you'll find. If you want wisdom, knock and the door of knowledge will be open to you. It's only through the Holy Spirit that we're going to be able to show the right wisdom and discernment in situations when we need to come alongside others. And then Jesus does this brilliant thing. He takes everything he said and he puts it into one sentence, doesn't he? What does he say to us? He says, treat other people the way you want to be treated. 
the whole argument about judging others, the whole, even the whole argument about other things, about how we love each other, is all summed up in treat others the way you want to be treated. If you don't want to be yelled at, if you don't want somebody to come and pick your life apart, then don't do it that way. Find another way, a compassionate way, that you would want your friend to come to you and say, look, maybe you need help in this area. Let me journey with you. Not, you're doing this wrong, do it better. Or you never get anything right. Maybe you need to go back to school or some of the other hurtful things that people can say. Judging others can be a real problem. In fact, for some, it's become a way of life. Some people delve into a life of judging others because it makes them feel better about themselves. But they're just lying to themselves. We're just fooling ourselves when we do that because one day that same judgment will come back on us. One day the finger will be pointing in the other direction. Instead, Jesus tells us to walk a road of compassion patience and understanding so that when we find ourselves before him we will find compassion patience and understanding now last week I don't know if Rebecca's going to be annoyed with me because I'm taking over her service a little bit but last last week we gave people an opportunity to come forward to be blessed to uh, be prayed for if there was something that was on their heart. And I want to do the same this week. Maybe you're feeling judged. Maybe you're under uh, the thumb of oppression of judgment on your life. Maybe you find yourself in a cycle where you feel like you can't help but judge other people and you need to be free of it because you want to live a happy, happier life. Leading a life judging other people is not a happy life. It's a miserable life because you see everything wrong with the world all the time. Maybe you need to experience the joy and the freedom of Christ. Or maybe you just need somebody to say, God bless you today and pray God's blessing over your life because at the moment you're just not feeling it. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to the front. I'm going to put Hydrant on the spot again. And uh, I have another assistant if they want to come, but if they don't, that's fine. And as we just sing, Rebecca leads us in this next song, Beauty for Brokenness. We just encourage you to come if you just want to receive a blessing or to be prayed for today. So it's, it's not coming to the mercy seat. We're standing there with you. It's not you're coming to confess all your sins, unless that's what you need to do. It's just coming for a blessing today. Okay. We're going to sing uh, song 998, Beauty for Brokenness. And uh, this is our opportunity to come and be blessed today, to bring our brokenness to the Lord. You know, I was so excited last week to discover that uh, when Jesus talked about the lilies of the field, he was actually talking about poppies, which are the symbol of today, beauty for brokenness. And as we sing this song through, if you want to come forward and be blessed, do it now as we sing. Thank you. 
Lord, we thank you so much for the sacrifice so many have made on our behalf. They offered their brokenness and you made it beautiful. And Lord, today we also offer our brokenness to you. The damage that we can't undo. The times when we have done what is wrong and you have paid the price for it. And we pray that in exchange for all the brokenness, the beauty of Christ will be seen in this world and that you will bring healing and redemption and wholeness once again, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite Shirai to come and bring our announcements to us before we sing our closing song together. A very warm welcome to you all once again, especially if you're joining us for the first time. Um, thank you for all your prayers when we've been in Zimbabwe to um, lay to rest my mums and all your messages. Thank you very much. Uh, but please do continue to pray for others in the core family, uh, especially those that are far from well. So we've got Eileen, who remains in hospital, in Lewisham Hospital. And we know from the group chat that Romic and Kara are not well today. And also remember Douglas Henenberg and Douglas Gardner. Um, thank you. So thank you for all those prayers. Uh, some exciting news. So we are planning a Christmas party uh, on the 7th of December. So really exciting. Uh, we had a wonderful one last year. Um, if you need more information, I think it's Sharon, Ranga, and others who are organizing it if you want more information. But it will be on the 7th of December starting from 1 o'clock. And more information will be shared nearer the time. And then on Sunday the 8th, Hydran, you're doing a messy church, aren't you? So, um, Cafe Church. Cafe Church. They're very similar, aren't they? <laughs> We won't have this argument now. But yes, uh, we're having the cafe church on Sunday the 8th. So another exciting time. So we look forward to that. Um, there's some um, Salvation Army clothes. Um, if you're interested at the back, they're a bit on the bigger side, but have a look. A jacket, some shirts, and a trousers. So have a look. It's free to take. Yeah, if you uh, that's all the announcements. Please do join us for tea and coffee after the meeting. You can come and be messy at the cafe church if you want to. Sorry? Yes, God welcomes us all. We're going to sing our final song together. I'm going to invite, if you're able to stand, Thine is the Kingdom, Lord. And it's song number 227 in our songbook. Thine is the kingdom, Lord. Thou art the king of kings. Thy reign enfolds the universe and heaven its tribute brings. I'm looking for the number. What did I say? 227. I don't think that's correct. 277. It should be 277. We're going to stand up and raise our voices in song of praise and prayer that God will one day make everything right. Let's sing together.
you should have a small piece of paper. We're going to be very brave today, and I've lost mine, which is no good. I need it, actually. <laughs> Thank you. I feel that this benediction is a very appropriate one. So we're going to try and sing it unaccompanied, and I'm going to try and lead you. And I've... Uh, what is it? Coughing. It is the one we used last week, but we're not using the music. We're just going to sing it unaccompanied, and I'm going to do my very best with a cough. Okay? So I'll sing it through. If you know it, join in. If you don't know it, join in the second time. Okay? May your struggles keep you near the cross. May your trust. We're going to sing it again. Can you give me a better key? Because I started it too long. Okay. May, may your struggles keep you near the cross. May your troubles show that you need God. May your God bless you this day. May your battles end the way they should. May your whole life prove that God is good. Amen. And God bless you this day. <laughs>